Good evening, OPN. We're going to go ahead and jump right into it. We're going to wrap this up um, by the time the debate starts, but I want everybody to know this is going to be the real good part of the night. Um, <coughs> Zena has been working tech to get everybody online, so we have all our guests here, and Freedom LA may join in us somewhere in the middle, but we're going to go ahead and start. So I'll introduce everybody really quick. Um, everybody knows me. The person beside me on the screen is Organizer X, Keith Wrightson out of Washington, D.C. Matt Stop Motion Solo, right there, out Hello. of New York. We have Radical Potato out of Tacoma, <laughs> which is the world's greatest name. So Radical, can, Rad, speak up. We're not getting any... We're, yeah, we need sound check from her. Yeah, we're not getting any audio from Radical. And our friend Sean. Can you hear me yet? Yeah, yeah, oh, good. There she is. Yeah, great. So welcome, Radical. Oh, no. oh. Well, we lost her. Welcome, welcome, Sean and the baby. You guys can see the. <laughs> she's awesome. And Tori's going to be off to the side here to help referee. So um, no audio from whom, Ruby? You got to be specific. From anybody? Okay. We're going to go ahead and start. Let me make sure I got audio coming out. Is anybody watching? Tori, are you watching? Okay, I can hear audio. On the mic check, mic check. Yeah. yeah. All right, I think we're good. All right, audio good. So I'm going to frame the question really quick, and then we'll uh, run with what we got. Um, tonight we're going to talk about, you know, with the upcoming elections, we want to get everybody's conversation revolving around the question. Um, no. uh, she's going to be popping in and out. We're going to be revolving around the question of what is the value, if any, of voting. And so I want this to be a free and open dialogue and uh, just try to keep it civil and polite. And we'll follow any tangents that uh, we go out on. So um, what is the value of voting? Who wants to start it off? Okay. Well, so I guess I can start Yeah, it off. Sean, cool. you, you go. And this is a conversation, so everybody just chime in. This is not a Q&A like I normally do. So I'll just be like the moderator and send you guys to your corners if you're bad. <laughs> oh, no. Um, well, I'm personally of the opinion that, that money talks and big corporate has all of the money and they do all of the talking and voting is the one way that we the people, be as poor or rich or well-educated or not as well-educated, can voice our opinions for what we believe is right for our country and, and it, it's sad that we don't get more of an opportunity to do that, but, but voting is is pretty much where we can take charge if we chose to do it. Okay. Anybody else want to follow up with that? You're only allowed to. Hmm? Someone else is. Hello? I think, I think I have audio. I think that was radical, okay. and she's kind of freezing up a little bit. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Matt. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I still think it's important, um, but I think there's too much of a. Um, though I understand the reasons for it, <laughs> there's too much of an emphasis on uh, the only the two parties. Um, and though they only are two parties that actually have any shot at winning in the end, um, I. <laughs> um. Come back. Um, <laughs> though I, I though there's only two parties that really have a chance of winning the end, and that's only because they managed to outspend everyone else. Um, I think that it's still important to go and do it. Uh, mm -hmm. The other question is though, um, I don't want to. I don't think it's ever a good idea to um, discredit the idea of um, doing or voting for another party or doing a write-in vote, for example. Um, though those, the most you could do with that is a political statement, um, it's still, if a lot of people did it, 
And keep in mind, like, I mean, there's, if a lot of people did it, it would make a statement. It would probably make news in the end and saying like dissatisfaction of the election in general mm -hmm. of how people felt about it. So, if you did that, it could um, it could make international news, and that looks really bad. Which is and because right now, the a large a large amount of the American populace doesn't vote in general. It, it, statistically, they don't. Um, so if a lot of them did instead, it's not going to mess up. None of the people would do a write-in vote to have an actual impact, but in the end, it would certainly make a statement, and it would mess up the pollsters who were trying to decide because then they look at it and they're like, "Okay, I don't know how to categorize this vote at all," and it'd be kind of funny. Well, I think if more Americans did their homework on some of the other parties that we have around here, then then the fact that the Republicans and the Democrats spend more money would be completely irrelevant. It's not like uh, uh, they haven't been trying to get their word, word out mm. there. That they may not have the same funding or the same commercial ability, but if if we could get voters in general to care about the elections and to to go out and do that knowledge, it's out there. Their messages are out there if you wanna if you want to go find them. Um, and and I know people who swear by a third that third party base and and still don't even realize that some Republicans are just dressing themselves as independents to get around that the 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 Republican bad view, and either way it comes down to voters themselves not educating mm -hmm. um, themselves on what's going on with the candidates and what's going on with the elections. I completely agree with that. So uh, I I uh, think that um, you know. When we start at the beginning with the first part of the other uh, question there, that, that voting is important, but I don't think our votes make a difference any longer. I think probably for the last, oh, I don't know, 30 years or so, our votes really, really don't add up. Um, I think corporations and uh, the concentration of wealth and power um, control the parties. Um, I don't think we're voting for candidates anymore. We're only voting for parties, um, and that's, that's a big problem. Um, if you're not given all the information, which we absolutely are not, um, you're only voting for the party. Um, you're not voting for for Obama. You know, you're voting for the ideals of the uh, Democratic Party or the ideals of the Republican Party. And um, there's something wrong with that, drastically wrong with that. That we are stuck in a two-party system. Um, mm -hmm. This year, I'm not going to uh, to uh, to vote vote for. Uh, the Democrats. I'm going to vote for uh, for Jill Stein. So, um, and uh, I think um, you know we got a long way to go um, before our votes actually mean anything. If you take a look at the electoral maps now, um, you already know what's blue and red. There's only like five states where your votes actually matter. Mm -hmm. um, where you live, Mark, one North Carolina, your vote could make a difference. Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania. And uh, possibly Arizona and Colorado. Yeah. That's the only place your vote matters this time around. It's disgusting. The system's been hijacked. Well, and let's not forget how have they've proven time and time again how easy it is to tamper with those electronic voting systems. Where, if I remember correctly, there was one election where uh, a, a presidential candidate came out with negative votes because somebody had tampered with the electronic voting system so I, I think that's what scares me about the integrity of our voting system because um, to me voting is at the heart of democracy and if they don't let us do that if they don't let our voices be heard because of uh, these reasons the the electrical college and and the uh, um, the tampered voting systems and in, in and facts like now Mitt Romney's son owns um, a, Electronic voting systems in some of those swing states like Ohio. That it's, that it's sort of thing makes a lot of people. Uh, keep at it, radical. You you were there for a moment. <laughs> Sorry, my, my videos my videos out. But okay, audio. we'll we'll run with audio. So continue your thought. I think I lost it. <laughs> no, no, you're you're good. You're good. So you you were saying it was unfair to say that uh, Tag Romney owned. Uh, to say that say that Romney owns it, he is one of the companies that he's associated with is associated with people that own it. And yes, they do contribute to his campaign. And yes, Ohio is an important state for the Republicans. No Republicans ever won the election without carrying Ohio. But it's still unfair to say that he owns them. I'm a big proponent of um, being fact-based uh -huh. in our criticisms. 
of others. I, I think that's a, a valid point and a good one made about uh, facts in, instead of anecdotes because we sometimes our language gets in the way of us or, or muddies things for and so thanks for clarifying that point. We're glad we have you um, um, even if it's only on audio. Go ahead Matt. Um, I think uh, <laughs> I don't know all the details with electronic voting, but unless I'm mistaken, it's probably the machine that's counting the vote or that's recording it. Meaning it's, and I think in the past it's always been a person counting it up until now. So that's actually a blind vote, which is, I think it's unconstitutional in general. I mean, I might be wrong about that, but that's, I think that's unconstitutional to have voting in that manner. If, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Um. I'm well, not it conversing enough. Yeah. It still takes people to write the algorithms for that, and they've already proven several times that those algorithms, especially since they're taking the voting machines and working on them at home, those algorithms can be tweaked with. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the point that I was trying to get at. Yeah. Yeah. That could make things interesting. <laughs> I mean, machines aside. If even even if the votes were counted, uh, does does it really make a difference, Matt? You pointed that only a small majority of the uh, the base actually votes. Um, mm -hmm. I can remember in you know where I'm from in Massachusetts, uh, most elections polling in between 15 and 20 percent of the population in the city of Worcester. Um, I don't know what the populations of voters looks like in New York. Maybe you have a an idea you can let us in. Um, uh, to know a little bit um, about that or in other locations, but isn't that the problem? <laughs> Not machines. Well, uh, I'll say to, in, uh, the US in general, the votes. Uh, it's it's the people that are not voting that are that are you know sitting at home disingenuous of the system it's not just anarchists out in the streets yelling and screaming that votes don't matter i think you know the larger majority of the working class already has this figured out yeah um i th just to answer your question i think um with the reason new york always goes blue is because new york city itself is blue but i think um it's much more mixed if not almost, if not largely red outside of New York City, it's just that the city is so populated. There's um, it it ends up being a blue state. I think that's how it is. And uh, regards to what organizer said, uh, Keith, I completely agree. <laughs> um, it's pe most people are completely disf disenfranchised, and we, I mean, I know I am, but you know, I'm going to go there and vote anyway. But or make my voice hurt anyway but yeah go <laughs> radical be an active part hmm? i said you're going to be an active participant and that's a problem that's you know that's a good it's not too good well if i go out and do a um write in vote for example <laughs> and uh, if enough people do that it can make a statement and that's another way of voicing your opinion now it would also make a difference if you went out and just casted a blank ballot because those True. numbers get recorded too True, 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 true. Radical, did you have a comment you wanted to jump in? Well, I was going to say that um, in the U.S. in general, during presidential election years, participation floats around 50%. It goes from about 49 up to, I think, 65, all the way back to, like, 1960. It sits around 50. So that's a 50% participation rate as a rule of thumb? Yes. So for presidential elections. For, for elections in presidential years, yeah. Okay. So what we come down to oh. is there's 50% of the population essentially, um, in, in theory, making the selection for the total population. Well, unless, unless the courts step in and decide to make a decision based on that because some count or some state didn't quite count, and now we have to have the court tell us who did actually won or decide your electors won. goes faithless and just votes for who they felt like voting for instead of following the popular vote which is perfectly legal and perfectly constitutional for them to do mm -hmm. so um let's come back to the the core question if we if we all can disagree with the fact that the system is fairly dysfunctional the duopoly doesn't actually serve the people well then again, we come back to what is what is the intrinsic value of voting within 
within the parameters that we have now because I did a little research into voting is I mean the, the the whole political system has pretty much been in place for 235 years it hasn't changed much it's probably not going to change much before the election the next election cycle so what is the value of voting and what do we do with all this information how, how can we turn this around I personally think that there would be more value in voting for our country if there was more integrity in our voting system. Uh, we did a news story uh, over our show that 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 videotaped Congress people committing voter fraud, and uh, and it, what starts on top ends up just kind of working its way down. Wherein um, would we don't have? I don't think we have that much voter fraud uh, amongst the states, but where we have things like tampering or people just kind of giving up or, um, you know, the court stepping in and making decisions for us. I, I think that in order for us to reclaim the integrity of our voting system and make our votes matter again, we would have to do things like apply a more uniform style of voting, especially in, in, in national elections, instead of having one state say, okay, well, you cast your vote for this representative of your state, and that means you also voted for, if I remember correctly, Rick Santorum, and that's kind of, they, they set it up in a way where if you cast your vote for one guy and that guy endorsed a presidential candidate, then you automatically voted for that presidential candidate in the primaries. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we reclaimed our systems and stopped letting people count votes behind closed doors and, and, and demolish the integrity of it like that, then we would have more um, intrinsic value to our voting. I think the, the big barrier to value in voting is the number of opinions you're allowed to express you're given two or three options and that's what you're supposed to roll with is i can vote for the red or the blue or maybe the green. and none of that has any real impact on the major issues like economic policy war policy profiteering corporate friendliness none of that changes depending on which of those two candidates you vote for mm -hmm. um I think one way that you could, um, I'm not sure exactly sure how you would do this, but um, one way that you could make, as far as not voting itself, but voting would come as a result, um, make the actual politicians more accountable and find a way, if you, when you get money out of it, out of the equation, and money's really the big corrupting, corrupting issue, when you get money out of it, um, if you can do that, then the actual vote will be much more legitimate. Um, as, as obviously Keith said earlier, you're pretty much just voting for corporations at this point. Um, what's it called? If you can find a way to discourage money to go, money from going into the system, maybe not like make a law against it because that's, that'll never get passed. They just won't. Both uh, both Democrats and Republican parties are making too much money off of the money in politics for them to sign a bill to get rid of it. Um, so. You'd have to find a way to discourage anyone from getting involved with that with that kind of a thing, and eventually it might work out to make voting better. Um, I have a question coming out of the chat that seems to be fairly. You know, about a month ago, uh, the, uh, the president. Uh, wait a second, maybe it'll refresh. Okay, there you go. Go again, Keith. Oh, he's frozen. So I'm going to go ahead and toss this question out, and we can bat it around. Uh, one of the chatters asked the question, which I think is you know pretty good. Should people vote their conscience in 212, or vote for or against a particular candidate? <laughs> um, it's. That's a strange question. Personally, I would. I mean, it it depends where you are, because um, I personally I'm of the belief that one candidate might be theoretically better than the other one, even if marginally. Um, but if um, like in like a swing state, for example, it might be better to vote pragmatically. But if you're in New York or California, where it always goes one way, I'd say, you know. Vote, for your, vote your voice. It doesn't make a difference. You get it out there. More, the more people that do it, the more like it'll make a statement. 
It d depends on where you are in that case. I personally am sick of picking between the lesser of two evils. I, I am I have about had it with looking at this party or looking at that party and trying to align myself with one person's ideals or another. Because the fact of the matter is, is this group of people does not itemize everything that's important to me. And if I look at our our, our our political system, like, okay, who's the lesser of the two evils? Who's going to screw us up just the least than anybody yeah. else? Then really it comes down to what is the point? I personally would rather vote for my conscience, even if my voice isn't heard at all, because then I at least did something. Everyone who says, well, let's not vote, let's not vote, let's not vote. You are never going to get enough people to not vote because people with money are still going to vote. And that means that just has less, uh, you have less of the population controlling more of laws that are going to apply to you, whether you voted or not. I have a response to that, but someone else can go first if you want. Yeah, Keith or Rad, you got any, any feedback on that? Uh, personally, um, you know, I mean, saying let's not vote or vote, you know, the, the, two-party argument um, is one that, that um, I, I finally realized to be true. Um, I'm no longer going to have that guilty conscience. Um, so I, you know, am I dignified when I put my uh, bumper sticker on that says, don't blame me, I voted for somebody else? Uh, it's a possibility. Um, but I don't know what uh, is going to, uh, what it's going to take to move the middle class um, from becoming so complacent in the way that they do business and think about things. Um, unfortunately, I'm of, of the mind of, that thinks that shit needs to get really, really bad before it's ever going to get any better. Um, so I could really care less um, if, uh, if Obama wins or loses. It doesn't matter to me. It's very insignificant. Um, and I almost think that uh, we would be better off having somebody come in and take everything off the table. Yeah, would that be horrible? Would we lose all our social programs and, and uh, you know, would conditions be really, really bad? Uh, that's true. Um, there's no doubt in that. But um, I think folks are just sitting around on their hands anyway. Um, and uh, to get them to move, to move your base, something drastic <laughs> will happen. And uh, that's, that's where I'm at. Um, and I've been in this place probably for the last nine or 12 months now. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, I... That's about it, you know. I come. You want to go? I forget what your name is. Potato. Want to go? <laughs> Radical. <laughs> Radical. The problem that I have with voting in general is that a vote cast is a vote for legitimating the system that forces you to cast a vote that chooses between Coke and Pepsi, a choice that means nothing and accomplishes nothing in the long term. It having people vote in a candidate in then the people who voted for someone else just go, oh, well, not enough people supported me. So obviously the people want him, so he gets to lead the people. And that's simply not the case when we have 49, 50, 52 percent of people turning out for presidential elections. It's you only need, what, 30 percent of the population to vote in your winner? Mm -hmm. And so that's taking the electoral college out of it entirely and not considering things like uh, winner takes all districts or states where um, if the state primary goes to a certain candidate, all the electorate votes will go to that candidate, whether or not that candidate won in your district, whether or not you voted for him, whether or not he won by a wide or thin margin. Mm -hmm. So my question for you, Radical and Keith and, and Stop Motion, if you'd like, is, is what would be um, a better alternative? I mean, uh, with the with the excellent True. point that you just made, Radical, I, and and I can totally see where you're coming from on that. But what would be a better alternative than, say, opposed sitting around on our hands like some other people? Well, I mean, first of all, let's take the president part away from from this discussion, and let's talk about every other year. The president's only coming in every four years, right? And um, I still believe it to be true that only 20% of the population votes uh, during non-presidential years. Um, and let's talk about the fact that these are the people that are going into the Congress that actually have the power to over the president, right? So that's how the system was designed in the first place anyway. The Congress and the Senate controls everything that happens. And if people aren't voting during those periods, then we're really screwed. I mean, what's the president have the ability to do? He yeah. can sign 
executive orders. He can issue presidential policy directives. That's about it. He can screw with the financial uh, uh, monetary policy. Um, and that's that's about it. And, and uh, appoint judges. Um, but it's actually Congress that makes laws. Um, and uh, I just have a hard time believing that uh, so many people have just walked away from the system. I don't know what the answer is um, uh, or what the alternative is. I'm actually okay with the representative democracy. Um, but you have to take the money out of the, qu the equation, the special interests away. All these little advocacy groups, one that I even work for, we need to go away too. And we need to build a class-based movement that can sustain the, uh, the power of, uh, of um, corporations. You know, that's what it comes down to. Um, I have to say that uh, <laughs> mentioning the Congress there, I, that's probably, I mean, right now we're talking about uh, president, but um, I have to say it would be quite, an, since the, just cause since the debates are coming up, I have to say it would be quite an interesting question if they ask something with regards to how Congress works to both presidents and see how they would respond to that. It would be a very interesting debate question. Um, I just... Because uh, no one really thinks, everyone's thinking about the president only right now. And the president's, you know, but this, he's just one person. The idea between checks and balances is that each person has their own power and they're supposed to like go back and forth and like it, one person can't control everything or one group can't control everything. Um, but um, what's it called? As far as uh, sitting on your hands, that's, I think you can, voting to me is the icing on the cake. Um, you go there and you vote for someone who's supposedly going to do something you want them to do. The way you ch tell me what you want them to do is you make a stand, you make a spectacle, you get public support around it. How do you get public support? Petitions, demonstrating, other things like that. But do you think that the voting is the only thing you could do? Is it just? It's an example. It's, really, it, it's really apathetic and lethargic. I'm sorry. American political process. Um, I, um, I I would say I. Uh, agree with what rad just just said and and keith made a good point um i i think you know i'm not supposed to be part of the debate but i want to chime in um i think that the 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 power of the national political system rests actually in congress even more than the senate uh because you you can see evidence of that and the lack of participation in electing those congressional members is is a serious serious issue mm -hmm. and and i want to make and the lack of advertising in major campaigns for congressional members there aren't big flowery debates and huge news debacles and giant photo ops and this and that and the other flowery frills that all go along with the presidential election when it's an off year when it's right. when we're voting for things like our representatives and our senators that stuff simply does not occur because they want us to focus on the meaningless on the figurehead who doesn't control anything who doesn't really have the power here they want us to focus on that so that that's where we expend all our mental physical activist energy is on that when it actually has no great impact yeah and and radical oh, i want to i i i, I, I want to follow up a, a question so so in in your definition who is they i want to clarify it, that Good question. Not not some Illuminati tinfoil stuff, not like that. Uh -huh. But it's a great cavalcade of individuals working to support a, the system that exists to perpetuate profit and corporate interests worldwide. And you can't deny that there's been a strategic advancement towards that for many years. Just mm -hmm. not necessarily through individuals and memos and creepy spy stuff, but through things that are accomplished, what gets done, who makes money. Yep. At the end mm -hmm. of the day, that's the tally sheet. Um, I have to, I just want to chime in creepy with this. Oh, yes, very much, very much so. <laughs> um, the idea of, um, I just want to quickly and say that the idea of a, like a write-in vote, if everyone did that, like just voice their opinion saying no confidence or mic check or the people 99% or I don't like them or whatever. Uh, if everyone did that and that made that would make international news in the end and it would make 
it would make a mockery of the system internationally, and that would look like that would really cause things to cause a, quite a disturbance in the, between the powers to be and how things are actually done. Because they don't, I mean, they're mo they're, if their interest mainly is in business, that affects um, the American, uh, the United States credibility in a, a global scale as economy, if we're that dissatisfied, and is that obvious? Well, all of that is hinged upon us being able to get the voices of the people louder mm -hmm. than the endorsements of Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. Right. Good, good point. Um, so I want to just make sure I... I have the right context before I ask the next question. So, so X is is a third party guy, and Matt, I'm not clear on you. Are you uh, one party, or you don't have to say which one? But do you? Are you no, no. You said third party <laughs> earlier. There's a reason um, for I this. Vote, I'm voting for the third party in the other uh, presidential. Uh, right. On, Okay. For the top of the ticket. Right. For the top of the ticket, I'm voting for the third party. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But I just moved here to Maryland, so I'm not voting for anybody else but the uh, the issues because I don't know anybody else. Right. Mm. So unlike preceding years where I just would have checked D across the board, uh, that's not going to happen this time. So. I am excited about the ballot questions, though. Here in Maryland, there's a uh, you know there's gay marriage, there's uh, there's casinos, um, and uh, there's uh, the Dream Act on the ballot here. So um, I'm very happy to uh, to voice my opinion about the about those uh, those issues. And those are all referendum issues on the Maryland ballot. They are. Okay. Yeah. There's also uh, an anti-union measure on the other ballot. Granted, it pertains to the police force um, and uh, taking their collective rights away. Um, I'm still, you know, I still have to support labor. Um, so that's what it comes down to. Uh, mm. Yeah. Okay, Matt. Back, back to you. Are you, are you, one <laughs> okay. of the one of the two main parties on the presidential side? Or are you looking at third party possibly? Um, I'm not. Look I mean. It's complicated. Um, I'll say that it's between the two parties, I have a preference. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> but um, all, but it's very strong, like weird preference because like it's like whatever. I mean, right. there's. And I'm not asking you to say who. I'm just trying to because my next question matters uh, around the no, duopoly no. versus um, the third party. Like. I think that um, what I'm going to end up doing is kind of a cheeky sort of vote. We'll see what happens. Um, but it's – I'm not voting Romney or Obama because I'm in New York and it's going to go Obama. I really don't care. Mm -hmm. um, but what's it called? As far as – I've more power to you if you want to vote for Obama or Romney or even a third party. Seriously. It's it's more power to you and I, that's really awesome. But um, to me, it's like I'm kind of thinking of voting for the winners. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> And uh, Rad, you're you're leaning towards alternatives. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, I don't play games with people that cheat, so I'm not voting main party to be sure. I totally want to have you on for a one-on-one -on -one interview. You'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and and Sean Sean has said said alternatives. So so here's my question. Since it seems like most everybody on the panel is um, going to going to probably select an alternative in the presidential election outside of the duopoly, which which I I fully understand, um, are there's going to be said such a bad influence. <laughs> the, there's there's going to be there's going to be consequences as a result of voting. You know, all the way down the ticket from the president through the senatorial races, if you have any of those in your areas, down to whatever local races, you know, governors, I mean, and even in some places, mayors and stuff. So there's going to be, there's going to be a result and there's going to be a consequence there. If, if you vote for an alternative under the current environment, that pretty much is not going to sway things one way or another. So what do we do about the consequences of that block of votes not being applied in one direction or another? And are we willing to accept whatever consequences come up? Um, it's not our fault. 
It's not our fault, Matt, Mark, if uh, the Democrats don't win. You know, they, they should be thinking about how to get our votes and uh, dropping bombs and being corporatists is not going to get my vote anymore. You know, I've, I've, I've just become disgusted with, with the party and what it supports. Mm -hmm. It supports anti-labor measures. Um, <laughs> it supports war. It supports drone strikes. Um, you know, it's yeah, I'm not gonna be... people on welfare checks. Um, and, um, you know, everybody deserves upward mobility in this world. We all deserve a job. Uh, the Democrats are the one that started, you know, all the free trade agreements mm -hmm. um, that are unfair. Uh, Bill Clinton, Bubba, NAFTA. as you will, uh, is the one that started this whole thing. Um, and it's just continued from president to president. Um, Anti-regulatory language is now in any conversation on the Hill. I know I see it every day. Um, how are we going to get rid of these regulations? Blah, blah, blah. Too much red tape. They've dominated the conversation. And the Democrats are playing party to it. You watch what happens after Obama gets in. I guarantee you by December you're going to see a Medicare reform or a Social Security uh, proposal that's just going to blow your effing ears off. Um, I look forward you're not going to be happy. So um, that's, that's where I stand. Um, go? Okay. I look forward what he just said about um Obama cutting something he's not actually said he will, but he's certainly refusing to take Medicare, Medicaid, SS, Social Security off the uh, chopping block. So I actually in some ways look forward to seeing if he does cut it because if he does, I mean, it's going to suck a lot for people who you need it. And I really, it'd be horrible. But at the same time, it'd be a nice um, dose of reality if they go, no, he won't do that. And then it happens like, oh, told you. I mean, you know, whatever, it's whatever. And there's, uh, the sucky thing is there's not much you can do about it. Um... As far as um, if you vote otherwise um, down the line, right now I don't think there's enough strength or there's enough um, there's enough of a movement to actually cause an effect on the overall election. You need a lot of people to do that at once to actually have an effect like that. Um, and I don't think that we have that right now. And also, there's so much hype around the debate about debates and the uh, election as it is with what it is right now. There's too, so much fear around who's going to win. And based on that, people are going to go with their instincts when their instinct is to do what they've already been doing the past, you know, decades, whatever. So I don't think voting down the line differently for a few people is going to make that much of a difference. Um, and, and I don't know. I, I want to take and play on something that you just said, too, because you, you brought up the word fear, and that's a really great point, because I was told from a very young age that most people who vote in a third party system are just taking away votes from that lesser of the two evils and we need to help the lesser of the two evils win and we're not helping them win if we vote third party because that third party does not have a chance. So we should accept that they don't have a chance, vote for either red or blue just to keep the more evil guy out of the office. I don't let fear dictate my actions like that. And to play on something that Keith said earlier, if the Democrats lose, and I usually tend towards Democrats because the Republicans, especially lately, have been a little bit extreme for my taste. Um, if, if they don't win, it's because they could not win. If enough people vote for third party measures to a point where um, it, it could make a difference by not making a difference. Things like that don't happen overnight. If if the if the third party base was only um, less than five percent when it started, and it slowly grows over the course of how many generations, we could eventually make the change. But not as long as people keep having this mindset of oh, if we don't help the lesser the two evils get in, then we're just going to suffer all the more for it. If that's the case, then maybe what Keith said at the beginning of this is right, and. We just everything will change once things gets bad enough. Also, um, I want to build that. Um, even if Romney is elected president, if there's enough public support to have universal health care, he'll sign it because he's gonna get terrified of public. If there's enough public support, he'll do it because all the president wants to get reelected in the end. And if they don't, if they think, and they, in the end, like unless votes are completely neglected. Uh, unless votes are completely disregarded by the establishment itself, um, if there's public support for a certain thing and th it's obvious that there's no way around it, they'll sign it. That's a good, good point. Um, Rad, do you want to weigh, weigh in on this? 
Well, I think that the problem with voting as it stands is that it should not be a debate of one, two, or even several sides. We need more voices and more opinions and more candidates. And yeah, uh, it's our responsibility to try and do the best we can for our country, but does that extend to crossing your own moral compass to vote for someone who is that the lesser of two evils, that phrase we've been tossing around, mm -hmm. it, does it extend to saying, well, he's pro-war and pro-Israel and pro this and that and all these other things that we may not agree with, things that we may not like, things we may think are horrible. Does, is our responsibility still to vote for that because the other guy seems a little bit worse? A good point. So I want to, um, there is a, there's a question specifically for X coming out of the chat, but I'm going to hold that one off because I want to ask this last one to the panel. Um, and I'm, I'm going to give an opinion right now. I, I, I see, I think that the end results of these upcoming elections in the next couple of weeks, the end result is going to be the same. Um, in January 1st, the budget sequestration rules are going to kick in, and it's going to be the United States population first taste of austerity measures. Those are on the books. They're going to happen. Nothing can change that. So we're going to get a taste of some pain there. Um, the second thing that's kind of up in the air and on the agenda is that the, the next president will probably appoint at least one, if not two, Supreme Court justices, um, which, you know, that in itself is a whole different show, Supreme Court justices, something to be concerned about, too much power rest mm -hmm. there. But if we know all these things, if, if, if this election essentially is a lost cause, Sorry, people. My internet crashed, so we lost the feed. So, and I apparently um, came in on uh, on the tail end of something interesting. So, um, do we need to revisit whatever you guys were talking about? No. Who was causing no, trouble? Apparently, what did what did Sean say? There was no moderator, so there was no rules, right? <laughs> While I was gone. Okay, so I don't no, know. No, how... This is what happens when I try to facilitate Mark. I'll, it I'll just goes to hell, loose. huh? <laughs> All right. Yeah. So the letter being that she was in on it. I don't know where <laughs> where I was in my soliloquy, but my my point was how are we going to break this logjam? We'll concede this election's a disaster, a mess. No good is going to come out of it, no matter what. <laughs> how do we break the logjam? So in two years. When we're in midterms, we can make a difference. So, suggestions. Money out of politics. Constitutional amendment to ban and the overturning of Citizens United. Okay, I'm down with that. <coughs> yeah, I fully agree with that as well. I think that getting money out of politics and banning Citizens United would be pretty much the biggest step in reclaiming our... our integrity for our voting system and just democracy as a whole money out of politics but um i and though i see the importance of reversing citizens citizens united um it's just a step in the right direction because they really just there was still a lot of money still involved in political in the political realm before that happened so though it's important it's just a step in the right direction they need to get all money out and just make it publicly funded you say that, Matt. But you're gonna you're gonna have a hard time convincing anyone to publicly fund anything when we're in our first, second, third, however many iterations oh. of austerity cuts. Oh. What are we gonna publicly fund? With what funds? And why would and, uh, we? Because the people who created the problem to start with are now the ones trying to create the solutions. We need new people. Yeah, we actually, want to find a snake oil actually you, you'll all find this pretty interesting um back in august of uh, 2012 both both houses passed a bill that banned public funds from conventions 
um, from the political conventions that took place, you know, in Tampa and um, and in Charlotte. So going forward, all political conventions, presidential conventions, will be funded by private entities. There's no more public funds allowed into those. Uh, can you uh, send me that link? Uh, just Google it. You can find it. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. I didn't know. That. That's really – that's wow. That's, that's really messed up. Okay. Well, just to so, make a point on, on that, you know, it was supposed to be free and clean uh, for the DNC, and they came up $12.5 million short, and so Duke Energy is picking up the tab for the $12.5 million for DNC. So that kind of tells you all you need to know about that. We're going to have environmental deregulation again. Yay. <laughs> How did they spend fifty million dollars on security down there? Did that look like fifty million dollars to you, Matt? Around you know, us, yes. I, I was there. <laughs> Mark was there. Did that look like fifty million dollars? A couple of bikes and five hundred cops. There was a lot of hidden street? hidden that overhead was, there. Is all imagine? I can figure. It was it was pretty yeah, traumatic. You got to yeah. think of all the exactly. overtime they're paying to all the officers. They cleared out jails that were nearby so that they'd have room to put these protesters in jail in case they needed to. And, this happened at both the DNC and RNC. And we have right. to think about the, the only, and the only person that got arrested was John Penley. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I do want to make the point that uh, part of why I wanted to, to do this show was because of the, the lesson that I left Charlotte with was the extreme apathy and complacency of the average citizen around. Because the, there was, on, a, on the one day, there was maybe, maybe a thousand people for the Sunday march, but then the rest of the time, as far as protesters go, if there was a hundred people consistently we were lucky. A hundred people in a country where we we all agree everything's going down the toilet. We all know where the problems lie, but you can't mobilize more than a hundred people to come in there and just, you know, really make a stand and take it over. And I see that as a problem. So I want to get this, this question in for, for X. Go ahead, Potato, while I'm, I'm looking this up. I was going to say that it it's my opinion that people are deferring to their, their Maslow's hierarchy of needs when it comes to things like protesting. Like, even if we go all the way back to the beginning of Occupy, like spending your time at a camp, holding a sign, all that, that's not as important as not losing your job and having a place to live and things to eat and money to put gas in your car. You can't expect these people to give up every single thing that they've worked their entire life trying to wrench out of this destroyed system, out of this manipulative system. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can't expect people to just throw that away, and that's the problem you have with any large group agitating for movement, is no one wants to join until they already see it's going to succeed. So you have to find the people that will, that are willing to give up, that are willing to sacrifice, that are willing to just fight on every front. Mm -hmm. before you have enough where it looks like the, the people on the fence, the people who agree with you but are too driven by fear or money motivated or whatever it may be, the, the on the fence people need to see that your side's going to win and then you'll get that final rush of everybody giving you that massive majority. So it's we'll like you have to build critical mass and get to the, to the to point of momentum for people to join us. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's where that's where uh, situations like mine get a little bit fuzzy because I, uh, when we went down to Occupy, I pretty much threw everything but the college education I was working for to the wind, and now I have him. So I have to find a happy medium between feeding my family, quite literally, and and still being a part of of the movement in a way that would be significant. And so, and, and, you know, to coming up with food, unless, unless I can figure out a spot that's not too poisoned to grow it myself, you know, it, 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 it's trying to rework your life so that you have to be less a part of the system and less a part of the system and less a part of the system. And, and for me personally, that takes baby steps figuring that out. Right. Um, and we, yeah, literally. And, you know, I'm a big proponent of building a new system. So I want to thank all you guys for being here and participating. Sorry for the technical glitch there. 
uh, at the 45 minute mark, uh, it happens. You know, all of you know that. Um, I really appreciate seeing seeing you here, Radical. Well, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. It was great, and I do want to talk to you about doing an interview one on one. Uh, Sean, it's wonderful That's to see you. Glad to see Rob participating in the chat, and thank you for holding holding the, the door open while I was crashed and Zenner was trying to help me get back on. Appreciate that a lot. Matt, good to see you. Keep doing Back the good, good works. Um, Zenner, thank you so much for doing all the support side stuff. Um, May, we're not getting your question in because I do want to wrap this so everybody can pay it get a get a look at the debate so we can all yell back at the shouting tv box and get that out of our um, out of our yeah by the way yeah folks with regards to debates um hashtag debates hashtag debates 2012 and hashtag 2012 debates are could be fun to troll with <laughs> great and thank you for being part of our you know first ever community panel we hope you guys will join us again thank you opn for watching for Global Thank for mirroring us so and uh, Occupy World News Now. If you guys were covering us tonight, we appreciate it. Thank you, all the chatters and viewers. And uh, we'll see you Wednesday night for the call in show. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.